Anthony, would you eat something that didn't have a nutritional label on it? No. Well, yes, I probably would, but I know what you mean. I actually grew up with somebody who works in a sausage factory. They don't eat sausages. Doesn't sound pleasant. No, it doesn't. But it's a good point because AI companies, there's like, what, 10 of them? Only a handful. In terms of like the massive ones who are gonna steer the next 50, 100 years of developments, right? And they've got a person at the top, a chef, who is deciding ultimately what we eat or are exposed to. Yeah, they have millions in cash, captive users to deploy, but they don't have a whole ton of trust. No, exactly. And they're gonna be feeding us the meals. So I think, and I'm sure you agree, that we should probably ask them- How the sausage is made. Yes. Big tech has always played a role in how we engage with the world. The dominance of Microsoft Windows dictated how we interact with personal computers, and Google became the gateway to the internet with both Search and the Chrome browser. But back in the day, systems were more open for others to build on. That started to change with smartphones, which triggered a battle for control over what can and can't be installed on billions of devices. Take Apple's iOS system and the App Store, for example. Over time, companies have become more protective of the software and hardware they develop and how well it plays with others. Artificial intelligence is no different. All the tech giants have a horse in the AI race. Microsoft-backed OpenAI has GPT-4, Meta has Llama, and Google has Lambda. These language models are rapidly becoming the backbone of AI systems. So how they're built has big implications for how AI is used. So what happens when AI's leading innovators are also gatekeepers? Companies have clout, cash, and millions of captive users. Their models could eventually become embedded in the apps we use on a daily basis, from Gmail to Word to Instagram. If there's anything we learned from social media sins, it's that technology can get messy when commercial interests meet societal responsibility. By taking an early lead in AI, tech companies are setting the standard. The question is, whose best interest will be at the center of it? Joelle Pinot, thank you so much for joining us. You're head of Meta's AI Research Labs and an associate professor at McGill University. Hello. Now, I'm curious because it's been about five years since Meta's AI Labs opened in Montreal. Mm -hmm. If I'm right. What's been accomplished in that time? Give us a sense of the achievements. It's been a busy five years in AI, I have to say. And, you know, we have a team in Montreal. I joined Meta to, to really start the lab in Montreal. But over the years, that lab works in close collaboration with researchers in New York, San Francisco, London, our labs around the world. Um, the, the field of AI as a whole has completely changed. And in particular, we've seen a huge rise in terms of building foundation models for AI. For, so very large models that ingest large quantities of data. And out of that, you can customize them for a wide range of tasks. Mm. So we've been very active in this area. So this would be something like Llama. As, as well Llama as is our latest, yeah. our latest child. Yeah. <laughs> How do you come up with, with a name like that, especially after, I mean, everyone has like a kooky name for their own language model. How did Llama come about? Yeah, I mean, usually, you know, you aim for like an acronym that means something. So, you know, we're playing on language models for, for Llama. You need like the, the acronym to, to, to be cute and you know potentially let you have a little um, animated toy or something like that. And then of course you have to make sure that you're not in conflict with other names that have been chosen by other models mm -hmm. and other things. So it, it was a long discussion to come up with that one. I feel like it's a, a stuffed animal friendly kind of name. Well, whenever I hear llama and tech, I generally think of Winamp in the 1990s, but that's another oh, story. So works. So one of the interesting things I think has happened over the, certainly over the last 10 years of, of AI's development is it feels like the shift in power has sort of moved out of pure academia and really into the sort of into the hands of big, big tech uh, and into the hands of a few very, very influential players. Like what's your sense on that as both an academic and someone working in a, you know, a ultimately commercial um, yeah. business? I think I have maybe a more nuanced take on it, to be honest with you. For many years, the development of AI has been happening both between academia and industry. If we go back 10, even 20 years, you know, we had places like Bell Labs, AT&T, who had huge investments in AI, 
sometimes those investments sort of follow a little bit the, the curve of our economy, and it's a little bit harder to, to push through having a large research group in industry um, in, in tougher economic times. That being said, um, I would say what we're seeing now is actually, yes, there's big company players, but they're actually a very lively startup scene where we're seeing many of the recent advances and models come out of that, of that scene. We're also seeing people move between academic world, big companies, small companies. There's different things you can do in terms of agility, resources, freedom between these three, these three different types of models. It's, it sometimes comes as, as a bit of a surprise of actually how open Meta is with its AI research compared to certain other, other places. And earlier this year, the Llama uh, model leaked onto the internet, onto BitTorrent. How do leaks like that change the way you think about what you're doing? You know, I think we always adapt to new information. The, the, the goal of the release was really to empower academic researchers, but also researchers in, in, in other settings to, to participate. And so, so it is disappointing when you release something and we were clear about the license and the conditions of use, the gating mechanisms. Um, it is disappointing when people choose to go around that, to, to be honest with you. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't fundamentally change the reasons why we are pushing for open science, which is really to enable that transparency, to really aim for excellence, to bring in the wider community. And so I think we were very clear about the intent of this model that we were releasing. But someone goes uh, around the, the license, it means that there's a signal to, to people who may not really understand these models very well, that they can just pick something up on the internet and, and turn it into something else, which isn't really the intent of. On the bias front, the pace of growth in the sector has been astronomical. How are you finding that progress within bias in, in algorithms and in your models currently? The question of bias and fairness is, is an interesting one because uh, unlike other concepts, it's, it's harder to define in terms that the machine will understand. It's harder to build in a criteria in sort of the computer language to say, you know, these are reasonable behaviors, these are not reasonable behavior. Um, much of that is associated with a very rich cultural context. Mm -hmm. It's and so why. as we build that in, it, it's, very, it's very challenging to do it in a way that's nuanced and reflects, you know, as a company, we operate in, in hundreds of countries. And so to do it in a way that reflects that, that diversity in a nuanced way. Mm. That being said, one of the things that we have found over the years is in many ways, when you improve the quality of your model, when you have a model that generalizes better, that takes on a broader set of topics with accuracy, you also reduce bias. And to be honest, when we release a model like Lama, we enable researchers to build new benchmarks and tell us actually the way you've been measuring bias is too limited, here's another better way. Right now, there are several benchmark data sets. Um, one of the things they look for is, for example, like association between like genders and employment. Right. If you find that you have like association between pronouns with a specific gender association and specific occupations, then you can, you can detect the prevalence of this. But again, it's related to a particular task and a particular data set. Are you comfortable with that pace of growth? Do you think we need to be going faster or will, will there be a time where we kind of need to take a step back and maybe reel in some of that growth? I, I'm driven by curiosity. And so, you know, there's always something new to discover. So in a sense, it's not like there's a, there's a right or a wrong pace. You know, there, there are the things you know, and then there's that frontier. And I'm really, you know, pulled towards always pushing that frontier from a curiosity point of view. What I will say is there's many dimensions to research. You know, there's the, the technical dimensions. We've talked of some of the social dimensions. And so when it comes to the pace of progress, one thing that's important is that these dimensions move together sort of hand in hand, that we don't like run away with some models without having the ability to measure some of the uh, important properties of these models as they impact society. So pushing on a technical state of the art and as well as a state of the art in terms of responsibility, that's important to me. And so that's something where I will, you know, if we see one running away from the other, we're gonna push on both of them. But if both of them are advancing at a fast pace, I think that's a really great opportunity for us. In a couple of sentences, what's one thing that no one is talking enough about as it relates to AI right now? One of the things that I think is important to talk about is 
how do we combine some of the work that's happening on, on generative AI with some of the work that's happening more on the fundamental questions like reasoning and, and find a path for these to come together? You know, there's some, some hypothesis that just keep on scaling and scaling data and models and so on is, is what is going to enable us to keep on making progress. And there's another side that really looks at how do we embed notions of, of reasoning, verifiability, and so on into these models. So I think there's a lot more that, that could be done there. And in these models in particular, the current generative models, you know, they're not very good at giving us a notion of that uncertainty mm -hmm. and building that into the model. You know, we had the example of how much they know about you and you can sort of predict from that. But how much don't they know? We're not, right. we're not talking about that and what's that whole space around it. How do we capture it? Where does it matter? There's a strong link between the, the technology and the use case, and these are not necessarily the, the same thing. In one sentence, then, your one big prediction for AI in the next five years? Yeah, anything that's exciting, scary? Um, I, I think the, the thing that I'm, I'm looking for is often, you know, AI becomes most useful when we don't see it. When, when it really becomes really deeply embedded in, in how we are, you know, how we're working, how we're, we're spending our time and our leisures and so on. And so, you know, right now we're seeing generative models are really in our face, but I think there's a path where a lot of that is just a companion to what we're doing that's just enhancing our abilities, whether our abilities to work, to communicate, to, to you know, to, to build communities. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, Joel. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. pleasure. Demis Isabis, it's great to have you here, CEO of DeepMind. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Going to jump in at the deep end here because DeepMind created a system that could become the best player of one of the hardest games in the world to be the best at, Go. Then you took that and you applied it to protein folding, what's next? <laughs> well, look, we've been trying to, from the beginning of DeepMind since 2010, when we started to kind of take on increasingly more difficult challenges, um, starting with very simple Atari games, actually, from the 1970s, and then building up, as he said, to go, and then eventually scientific problems. And we've been, all the way, we've been trying to build general purpose learning algorithms that eventually we hope could be applied to almost anything. Mm. And so, I mean, you're applying this now to, 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 to medicine. Like what, what, is the, what is the next practical result of, of that in real world, like medical? Yeah, yes. the next big breakthrough. Yeah, yeah the next big breakthrough. Well, like, you know, AlphaFold was to, about uh, solving the 3D structure of proteins. Proteins sort of are responsible for everything in the body. They also go, sometimes go wrong when there's disease. So it's, it, the next step is to actually design chemical compounds and drugs effectively to target the right parts of the protein uh, so that hopefully we can cure you know many many diseases so um, you know alpha fold is just one part of that whole process drug discovery process so we've actually spun out a new company called isomorphic labs to continue this work and actually start looking into chemistry space and figuring out how proteins and and, and ligands they're called chemical compounds bind um, together and, and hopefully to address diseases of all kinds. Do you have a timeline in your head of like when that next big thing will, will come about from, from any of these, any of this work that you're doing? Yeah, you can never be sure when you're doing cutting edge research, you can never be fully sure like when something will happen. I mean, if you could predict it, then it's not true research, right? Um, but on the other hand, uh, if you have a portfolio of things you're working on and uh, you start getting good experience about the difficulty of those things relative to the capability of your algorithms, you can start making some reasonably good estimates. So if you're working on say five, six projects, one or two of them will come to fruition you know, this year. And so uh, we have several irons in the fire, lots of very exciting things um, building on AlphaFold and, and, and adjacent areas to AlphaFold. Um, and I think in the next couple of years, we're gonna see a revolution in drug discovery. Let's talk a little bit about AGI. Um, and just for everyone's benefit, maybe yes. you could give us a summary of how you see AGI, you know, what that looks like to you, and whether we've taken any reasonably significant steps towards it over, say, the last year. Because I know you've mm -hmm. said that, you know, maybe within 10, 20 years, like, has yeah. your view on that changed? Well, look, a AGI systems is, is, a, is a particular type of AI system, right? And we, 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 we sort of help coin that term to mean uh, uh, general learning systems. 
and um, and and the idea is to have uh, eventually to have human level cognitive capabilities across the board. So a general system that's able to do many many things that cognitively we can do. Um, and so we're we're still quite far away from that kind of generality. But I think the the last few years have been increasingly getting towards that. And you know maybe uh, you know we're within the next decade that something like that could could I think we could end up building something of that kind of sophistication. How are you thinking about? the conversation around alignment and ethics and, and biases and in some AI models. And you know, you brought up the topic of reinforcement learning. Could you maybe boil it down for the viewers out there who are wondering how this fine tuning process works and how you're going about it at DeepMind? Yeah, so we, we've been conscious of the whole uh, alignment and ethics part of AI from the beginning. And now it seems like the whole world's working on it. But we always plan for success, even back in 2010, like even though it was, seemed fairly outlandish, maybe a science fiction dream to, to build AGI, um, we always sort of thought, it, first of all, it could be done. But secondly, if that was done, you know, how monumental a, a, a technology that would be. And therefore, it would have to be treated uh, carefully and thoughtfully and with, with the sort of uh, respect that it deserves in order to understand what these systems do and align them correctly, make sure that they have the right values, the right goals that, that we as, as, as humanity want it to have. So how do you feel about it when, you know, billionaires out there sort of say, well, you know, none of these companies can be trusted. Like, none of these people can be trusted to do this and they don't believe in ethics. They don't believe in AI. Like, what, I mean, how do you... What do you think when when you hear stuff like that? Well, I think you've got to look at the motivations of what what people why people are certain people are saying that you know and and usually it's because they're trying to catch up or or be involved themselves and you know you look at the actions those people take and um, you have to sort of infer that what the statements they make. What I can say is from from our point of view and DeepMind's point of view and Google's point of view and in the larger picture, we've always had that as a, as a key cornerstone of everything we're doing. We have this sort of phrase of um, being bold and responsible. So, you know, that's what I think we should be doing with AI. So you need to be brave with it because of the potential and the opportunity that's there. So, so I often say, you know, we should not move fast and break things, right? We should try and think ahead of time what the consequences might be, the downstream uh, impact of various technologies, these kinds of technologies, because they're so powerful, uh, before we put them out there, ideally. I mean, I know there was a, a while ago, I think you said something, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the closer that we get to, to some kind of AGI, mm the more we should consider like pausing the amount of power we throw at it mm -hmm. and figure out how we control it. I mean, assuming there is even a point that you can say, okay, well, today we created AGI, yeah. and you know, because it seems pretty hard to define, yeah. but assuming, let's pretend that you could, do you still believe that there should be that pause if we get close to there? Because obviously it's something that people have talked about, you know, pressing yeah. the pause button. Sure, I mean, it's pretty, as you say, it's a pretty difficult thing to define and it's a bit like sort of, um, you know, the slow incremental, pro well, it's actually fast incremental progress. So it's quite hard to, to define some of these terms. Um, but I, I, in general, my, my belief is that we should be doing more research, relatively speaking, on analysis and alignment and um, interpretability of these systems. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of economic imperative to do the capabilities work. And I think that needs to be rebalanced somewhat, but it has to be done in a coordinated way because there's no point in, in, in one actor or even one country doing that if, if it's not an international sort of agreement to do that. Otherwise, um, other, other places will continue to press ahead at, at full speed. So I think there has to be some kind of cooperation. When you say economic imperative, yeah. you're talking about the commercial interests also at play when it comes to developing AI and who's going to get there first and you know who's going to gather the most users. Um, are you, are, are, I mean, am I understanding correctly in that we can't expect to hit pause and then everyone trust that, you know, other companies are going to do the same as well? Yeah, I think they need, you know, I think you, it's not just companies, it's like startups and not just established companies, it's the whole ecosystem. So it's the whole kind of almost capitalist system that is doing what it's supposed to do, which is here's a very promising technology, amazing opportunities, obviously some commercial ones, scientific as well. I'm most interested in the scientific ones, but there's huge opportunity all around. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, Im imperative to, to do those things, you know, and, and, a, and a lot of uh, incentive, should we say, to do those things. Um, and then the question is on the responsible side of things, 
what's the incentive there, right? Of course, we would like, I think there should be more, but, but, but it's, 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 it actually slows you down in some ways on, 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 it can do on the commercial side. But, you know, for the everyday person who might not have been as steeped in artificial intelligence over yes. the past few years, everyone's kind of catching up and wondering, what does this organization mean for me as a user? Mm -hmm. And now that you, um, you know, the company is folded under the broader alphabet umbrella, what can we expect from, from that change? Well, I'm very excited about uh, creation of new products that with new experiences, um, with AI first type uh, of things powering it under the hood. Such as? Um, well, you know, you'll, you'll see that in the next in the next half year. Yeah, I can't can't reveal Will anything new today. Will my inbox become so, leader with well, AI? All of those things should be a lot more, you know, should, AI should be kind of an integral thing, a useful thing in your daily life that really adds value to your daily life. And I'm very excited about that next step and bringing DeepMind's technology and also other Google research technology to the forefront of all of the, I think it's like 14 billion user uh, products that Google has in So counting. definitely more consumer so, facing. Yeah, so then I think probably it will all become a little bit more household uh, name recognition uh, once it's affecting every, you know, every, everyday people's lives. Do you think trust in artificial intelligence and specifically in, in Google and some other tech companies is where it needs to be? And are we prepared for what's coming next? So we've been, you know, I've been thinking about this and many of my colleagues for, for many, many years and how we would deal with this moment, what things we need to look out for. So I think so far, I, I would say we've been very responsible stewards of that. Um, but I think, it, it, you know, this debate needs to be across all of society. So I think there needs to be a wide range of inputs into how this gets used. But in terms of like what values to put in, you know, what should they be used for? How should they be used? These are societal questions, not really technical ones. And we've always been incredibly multidisciplinary. So we haven't just got machine learning people and engineers and mathematicians. We've also got philosophers, social scientists, ethicists. So it's always been a really rich milieu of different voices and different ideas. And I think that keeps us very grounded um, and very focused on the bigger picture of, you know, and the responsibility we, we, we have. I have one quick question. Yes. Um, in his departure, Jeffrey Hinton, who is widely known as, you know, the father of mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, um, noted that he couldn't express his concerns with how fast AI was moving in his role at Google. Mm -hmm. Do you think, even as CEO of DeepMind, mm -hmm. um, you would still, if you felt certain concerns about the pace of growth or, mm -hmm. or other concerns about artificial intelligence, could you voice those in your yes, role as course. CEO? Of course you could, yeah. And, and Jeff Hinton could have done as well. I mean, maybe he felt he needed to because he's a new stage of his career. You know, I think he's, uh, I think he said he's sort of moving into retirement now. He's done after an you know, unbelievable career. So perhaps he wants to, you know, write some books or muse on things. He's quite a maverick, Jeff. You know, he's a very interesting character. I've known him for many, many years and we're, we're, we're good friends. And uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, his views on that. And, and, you know, I had to catch up. I haven't actually caught up with him in, in a couple of years and be interesting to talk to him further. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you. At the top of this episode, Jackie, we joked about seeing how the sausage was made. And since then, we've had Jeff Hinton leave Google. Doesn't love how the sausage is made. Doesn't. And wants to stand on the outside and at least be able to say yes, no, no, yes, no, and, and give his opinion. And I think, I think these guys know it. I think we might be at a turning point. Yes, I think we heard some consensus that while they may not be able to give us a nutritional label in its entirety, they're willing to give us an outline. And, you know, for now, maybe that's something. Yeah, maybe it's enough.